All right. Well, um, <laughs> hi, guys. <laughs> So I get the pleasure of uh, hopefully entertaining and informing you guys right before lunch. Um, how's everyone feeling? <laughs> awesome. All right. OK. So let's get started, assuming this thing works. All right, so who am I? Great question. I am Dorian Pula. I am a software development engineer at Points. And I work on the team that basically helps develop the loyalty program e-commerce platforms uh, that, we, that we build out for our partners. So in a, sort of to, to understand what we do, a good way of thinking about it is, you know all those, all those you know, uh, business consultants, software developers that have to fly around to go to their clients and you know, look at their clients in the eye, tell them, okay, I understand, here's your problem, let me fix it for you, and you know, hold their hands to make it so that you know, everything just works and everything will be okay. So those people end up being like frequent flyers and uh, f uh, frequent stayers in, in hotel rooms, and they end up racking a bunch of points. And uh, essentially, usually most companies let the, the employees that actually do a lot of the travel keep those points, and then if they want to redeem for a flight or a booking, they just basically uh, buy some extra points and they use our system, right? And so I work on the team that builds out the, uh, both the front end and the back, the API uh, platform for that. And, hold on. And basically, how does that work on a technical level? So I end up, uh, my team ends up developing a bunch of microservice Flask APIs, um, a bunch of uh, JavaScript-based uh, storefronts, and we also build the DevOps tooling to actually run everything. I'm also a contributor in, in the open source community. I've contributed to Ansible, Fabric, CPython, Flask. Um, I run a small project called Rookeries, uh, which is a CMS, because we all need hobbies. And uh, I am a, I've, I've spoken at PyCon US and PyCon Canada in the past, and I'm a Linux and DevOps enthusiast. And um, so hopefully, uh, uh, what I say actually makes, makes sense if you're, you're, you're a DevOps person. And I, like, I find that more and more, I like to try to answer the question of how can I improve the lives of a developer or operations people and sort of like level, level up their, the state of their, of their software engineering. Like it's just an interesting question for me to solve. So what is this talk about specifically? Well, this talk, goes into sort of what is the mindset that you need to scale, uh, how to not fall into sort of the common traps that most people fall into when, when they approach a scaling problem, and ultimately how to survive your own success. And what I mean by that, uh, you know how like there, there are people who like win, win the lottery and they're like, oh man, you're now successful, you have all the money in the world, right? But oftentimes, with that, they, they often end up being broke within like a year or two, right? So if they had uh, planned accordingly and worked, not, you know, invested properly, then they would have been all right. But, and oftentimes that happens with our, with our software projects, right? We become victims of our own success, right? We build it out and then we're burned out and we never actually want to work on development uh, ever again. So what is this talk not about? So it's not a talk about the five weird tricks of scaling to web scale. It's not really fuzz, uh, you know, uh, buzzfeedy. I also can't really talk about the scale, scaling on the size of Google and Amazon or Facebook because those are really large companies with really large teams. Um, I had the pleasure of uh, having dinner with, with an engineer from, from Facebook yesterday and he works on the, the, the Linux kernel team. So they can actually literally scale out their operations by changing the kernel itself. And most of us do not work on that level. So this, not talk, this talk is not about that. Also, this talk is not about how my company solved all of our scaling problems, because we haven't solved all of our scaling problems, which is a good thing, because I just started working on the, the DevOps team last week. So 
I have a huge backlog of things to do, which means I will be meaningfully employed for at least the next couple months. So how do you approach scaling? Right. Well, to get this discussion started, let's ask ourselves the question of what does it mean to scale an application or system? I was claimed that it is about developing the system at a reasonable time or cost, and cost, shipping the results to the end users, right? Because if you don't ship it, it really doesn't matter. Operating the system with minimal, hopefully no downtime, but let's, let's make it so that it works well. And ultimately, succeeding, right? Succeeding without inflicting a significant cost to yourself, to your team. Uh, you you want to avoid burnout and, and whatnot. And I do have some bad news when, it talk, when we talk about scaling. All engineering approaches are compromises, which means there isn't one way of that's going to work for everybody for scaling, uh, scaling a system. Another bit of bad news is that vendors and trendsetters are not always helpful. Um, following everything that is on Hacker News will not necessarily make it so that you can scale out your system. Um, it will just make you feel bad that you're not scaling big enough. But there is good news. This problem space has a lot of ambiguity. It's complex. And so your job, if you are in this space, is too tricky to automate out of existence. So hooray you. You have a job until somebody invents a general AI. But I think we're OK for that for now. So what kind of concerns should we have when we go into scaling an application? Well, we'll start off with the easiest one, functional requirements. So essentially, what are the features and the functionality that we are going to provide with the system? Why would the end users care? Another concern, well, you may have heard this one in the past, especially if you've worked on an agile team and you've worked with product owners. They say, what about non-functional requirements? That's actually a, I would make the claim that that's not a very useful term because Think about it a definition. If functional is the features that you're building, then non-functional is the anti-features, the brokenness in your system that you're building. So let's scratch that one out. Instead, we should be talking about the development concerns. So basically, how easy is the system to develop and maintain? How difficult is it to onboard developers? How testable is the code? Then we also have to worry about the operational side of things, right? Like, how the heck am I going to actually run this system for real, right? Just because it works on my laptop, that doesn't mean that that's going to be useful for any user. Um, and ultimately, you have to remember, like, you ship it, like, basically ship it, or it never happened, right? So let's sort of break down that idea into, this, into se its separate components. So let's look at sort of the feature level. So basically, how do you scale by design? Uh, there are a few sort of guidelines you have to keep, keep, keep in mind. And I think that this is actually one of the places as software engineers that we struggle, because it, this is more of a, a, a business product in, in you know, requirements engineering side of things, which we're not always used to. So how do we approach it? Well, first, we have to know what is the problem that we are trying to solve. And for that, we have to really understand what is the business need? What does the organization need? What do we actually are trying to do, right? Um, and honestly, the more focused the answer to that, the better the result is. Um, and that leads into, like, if you, if you have a good focus, then you can use techniques like domain-driven design to actually build out and engineer your system. Um, but if you don't, then you run into problems because you don't know where to stop. You don't know where the boundaries are, right? And an example of this is that there was, there was there's this talk somewhere that I saw about a team from, from Texas that essentially was building out the uh, Texas, um, I believe, juvenile correction system, right? And they did stuff for, you know, the courts, the police, the, uh, the people who were working on therapy and things like that. And so they built out this massive system, spent hours and hours building it out, having uh, 
case studies and trying to understand the problem domain, and they built a system that no one liked, right? It worked for everything. It worked for, the, for all the parties involved on all, all levels, right? It would work for a place that had one sheriff in town, and it would work for small cities like Dallas. Um, but they knew that, it, and no one really liked that system. But they did have a chance of redoing it, and they did sort of like the, the adult version, and they only did for, like, for the courts. And they were able to build out a system in much, much less time, which would much, much less cost. But that's because they had better boundaries. Because ultimately, they ran into this problem, complexity. It is the enemy of scaling. It is the thing that will make your system hard to scale. Why is that? Because the general case is hard to solve for, especially to solve for well. Um, in addition, even if you were to say, solve the general case, the more complexity you have, the less able your team is able to change it, so the less scalable you are as a development team. And yes, true, the, the, there is promise of like the Agile and Scrum methodologies to, to help you uh, manage that complexity, but you still have to have the discipline uh, just not to introduce it in the first place. And ultimately, the most scalable code that you can ever write is code that you never have to write, right? No, Non-existent code is the most performant code that you can get out there, right? So ultimately, this is the thing that you should be thinking. The less stuff I have, the better I can do it, the more impact I have using my system, right? Um, I mean, there are limits to how you have to still build it, right? Um, but it, it's the fewer business, um, the fewer business requirements, the better this, the product that you're going to come out with. And the funny thing is that as Python developers, it should be like, it should be that that concept should be part of our DNA. And uh, I can prove this. There's the Zen of Python, right? Written by Tim Peters, and it basically is like. It essentially says the same thing that what I've said in my previous slides, right? Just in more philosophical terms, right? Simple is better than complex, complex is better than complicated. In the face of ambiguity, the general case, refuse the temptation to, to guess. And now is better than never, and often never is often better than right now, right? Sometimes you just don't build out the thing that you never need. So that's on the, on the functional side. On the development side, you guys are, are, how many of you guys are software developers that work on web apps? All right, raise hands. All right, okay, so that's good because then I don't have to tell you guys how to do your, your job very, very much because you already do it. But there are some good guidelines that, that, that have worked for me and my team. And basically that's writing for the present, not for some ambiguous future that you don't know whether you're gonna need it or not because maybe you will not be, maybe that you're, uh, the business people will not be able to win that, that, uh, that client, and those clients' needs will never have to be built for, right? There's all sorts of reasons. So what you do, you just you keep it light. And you try to break out code as you go, because it's a lot easier to break, it out, break out a simple system than to strip down a complex system into a smaller parts. You can always microservice it, monoreap it, ship it as a library, whatever later, right? Don't worry about it when you're actually building it. Try not to write a framework if you can. There's a lot of them. Just pick one, commit to it. Don't write wrapping code around it, things like that. I've, I've, I've seen code that actually says, well, we're using Flask everywhere, but we're just gonna wrap around Flask just in case we need to move to Django. It's like, yeah, when did that happen? Never, never happens. Another thing is that if it's hard to explain or test, it's probably a bad idea. Um, now, true, there's, well, there's whole talks about how to test, test properly, breaking up your tests and things like that. Um, personal experience, PyTest is your friend. There are lots of great little libraries and tools for it. Um, that said, good system, uh, system engineering practice still apply. Keep your you know, concerns separate. Um, and just like before, check it out. It's in the Zen of Python, right? We have this already. 
like literally every Python terminal that you boot up, you can just put import this, and you have the secret to success right there at your fingertips. Okay, so let's get to the to last to sort of last sort of uh, uh, part that you have to think about when you're scaling, and that's operations. Uh, so how many people are like in the IT operations or have to manage servers here? Okay, there's a few of you. Okay, um, so you guys can go to sleep. For everybody else, um, I'm going to tell you why ops is your friend. Um, because, like I said, if you don't ship, it doesn't count. And I know that operations is difficult because as software developers, we don't always think about how our systems are going to be run. Why are, the, why are ops your friends? They help you run and ship things, the ultimate goal that you want to do. So help them, help you, help us all. And don't be the dev who, whose code break, breaks something, at, you know, wake, wakes up at someone uh, at one in the morning because their pager went off because it broke it. Try to avoid that. Um, and, and work with ops, because ops will, will help you resolve operational issues and will improve your infrastructure. Um, like, and one thing that you have to keep in mind is that operations is expensive. It's, it's expensive to find people who are able to, to go and, and basically baby your system to make it work and to make things run smoothly. And it's expensive. You'll have to pay for it. And there are many ways of doing it. You can either have people in-house to do it. You can get wonderful vendors that will do uh, third-party uh, ops work for you, like the fine folks at uh, VM Farms. Or yes, you can go to the cloud, which is essentially you having a subsidized access to the, to the infrastructure and the people who run it at, at, at Amazon and, and Google. So if in the unfortunate case, you have to actually be both the developer and the ops, well, that's kind of like DevOps, but if you, if you have to, some things to keep in mind if you have to manage your system yourself, you should be able to answer these questions like, did my system break? in which case you would use various monitoring, monitoring tools for your systems and your infrastructure. Um, I highly recommend going with something that's external so that if your system goes down and your monitoring is part of that system, uh, it's going to be hard for it to tell you about it, right? Um, you also fi have to figure out uh, why did it break when it breaks, right? We don't write perfect code. And that's where logging comes into place. And logging as an appropriate amounts of logging. You don't want too much so that it gets lost. You don't want too little so that your system doesn't look like some sort of strange enigma that you have to uh, sort of figure out. In general, I would highly recommend using syslog logging. It's a wonderful tool. Like Logging has been basically solved with syslog. It's got great support for splitting, formatting, slicing, dicing your logs in various aspects. Uh, you may also want to look at something like error, log, uh, error logging and monitoring in Sentry. That will help you figure out what, what are the parts to scale. Um, and this is, this is the ultimate thing of, of like when it comes to scaling, is that you want to figure out why is my system slow, right? If it's not, like, OK, so your system's not broken, but it's slow, right? Well, how do you know it? Well, you have to measure it, right? Before you can make any adjustments, you should measure it to figure out, hey, where, where am I standing, right? And how do I fix it? Um, tools like New Relic and others do that for you. Um, but you know, uh, if you want to approach scaling in a general, general way, you have to be able to know what you, want, what you need to scale. Or to the wise, don't use logs for measuring performance. I mean, yes, you may have a wonderful tool like Splunk that can slice and dice logs and can pull out timestamps, but it's not the, best, not the best tool for the job. Some other things to think, think about if you're running it. You should be able to know what is the state of production or any other environment that you, that you manage. Having repeatable and documented environments help, and it helps you from both the dev side of things because you can set up an environment that's similar to production and work on dealing with all the issues before you actually deploy it out to the real thing, before you have to ship. 
And if you're on the op side, it's good to have an environment that's described and managed programmatically so that you don't have to actually t uh, twiddle and tweak, tweak with it. This is where things like automated provisioning come in. And there are various levels of how much automation you want to put into place, right? Um, you can just go with something as simple as using scripts for using um, Fabric and Bash just to wire something up very, very simply if you have just one system to deal with. You can get up into using thing, tools like Ansible or, or Chef or any of those other sort of playbook-based systems. And if you want to pull all the stops, you go into something like full, full automatic automation like uh, Kubernetes that basically does everything for you, assuming they have to set it up. OK, so now that I've bored you with, with uh, um, sort of how to approach scaling, let's, let's take a look at, at uh, three different techniques of, of actually scaling, an app, of, uh, scaling a particular system. For this, I'm going to use a, um, an example, a to-do list app, because everybody does a to-do list app, apparently. That's the thing uh, that, everybody, uh, that everybody uses. Our to-do list app is going to be a little bit different because more than just being a bunch of to-dos on a list, we are going to actually encourage our users to schedule and finish tasks, right? And yes, we'll, and essentially the system on a basic level, it will, um, you'll have a web app, you'll have a database, and your web app right now currently manages everything, right? It has, and it doesn't matter if it's Django or Flask or whatever, you have both the front end website here, you have the APIs, you have the admin UI, so you have APIs for managing tasks and tagging tasks and users and scheduling things and running reports. All of that is in that one system, which just won't really scale. Uh, so what is one of the approaches to scaling this is microservices. That's the new hotness that everybody keeps on talking about. I know that some people have been burnt by it. Uh, so, uh, but essentially, what does it entail? Well, the idea is really simple. You just break out all of those separate resources, all those separate things, into one single specialized little modules that run, that run independently of each other, sort of like the Unix philosophy. So you end up with that, re remember that simple, simple web application with you know, one web app, everything code based in one place, and one database? So how does a microservice is going to look like? Well, like this. You have a website. You have a admin UI. It's running separately. They go for, all talk through an API. Um, and each one of the APIs have their own databases. Uh, and your reporting API now has async, an asynchronous generator with its own database, right? And this is not including all the load balancing, all the monitoring, all the other stuff that you have to put into place, right? This is just the logical diagram of how your system is going to be structured. So right off the bat, you can see that it's going to be a significant cha change. Now, just like with everything, there are pros and cons for using microservices versus other ones. So let's take it from, uh, go through our, our list of feature, development and operations things. So one of the pros is that you have the great, a greater potential of scheduling independence between different teams, right? Um, your team, if you have a bunch of developers, you can uh, break them out into separate teams. And one team potentially doesn't have to be on the same schedule as the other team. That's great, fantastic. But because you're working with so many different parts in such a really large system, it is easy to introduce transient dependencies. Um, dependency, one service depends upon another, either when they get start up or it needs information one from the other. And you get into problems, right? And one of the problems is that you have to be very, very strict with your boundaries. You have to have bounds between services. The services have to do one thing. If you need two services, to do one single operation, well, then maybe what you need is that one service, right? That those two services have to be bundled into a single service. Um, from the development side, there's a pro that, yes, you have independent development teams, potentially, 
There is a con, though, that you can't share any code or data between services. It's literally an anti-pattern. Uh, you shouldn't be doing it. Um, another one is that an unfortunate thing is that when you're working with multiple services to actually do one thing, tracking how your data flows and how your code changes through, across multiple ser services is just really, really difficult. It's a hard thing to, to juggle in your, in your mind all the complexity the, that, that is involved. From the operation side of things, there are benefits. You can uh, independently s uh, scale the different parts separately. Uh, their automation is not optional, so that's kind of that's a benefit and and a con, I guess. And you'll find that you need a lot of infrastructure and process to to need it in place to actually even do anything. Um, so let's go look at an, another option. What if we just stick with the monolith? Um, let's keep it simple. Let's just use one system. Boom. We have some load balancer, multiple instances. We've asynced our things, and our database is now sharded. Hooray, go us. Um, but just like with anything else, there are, there are pros and cons, right? Great, you have a single system to maintain, and it's more forgiving of ambiguous requirements. You still can, like it's also easy still to get into more complex sort of interdependencies because the code base is in one place, so you, could, you still have to be careful that you don't, you know, make a feature that, that spans multiple things. On the development side of things, pros, benefits, you get code reuse and it's easy to trace the system. Uh, it becomes more difficult to actually scale out the teams and saying who, which team owns which part of the code, right? Uh, you, couldn't, you probably could not run a Facebook on a monolith very, very well. And one of the things that people get time and time again is that over time, changing the code becomes difficult because of the complexity, the interdependencies, the inability, um, sort of scaling stuff independently as well. But there are pros. You have less things to monitor and to tweak, and there's less infrastructure. Um, but yeah, there are limits to what you, how you can scale out vertically, right? And like stuff like database sharding is actually a very difficult problem to solve. There is a third technique, um, which is basically, we could just pre-calculate all this, these things. Like, there's a lot of resources that we don't actually have to dynamically generate and serve, right? And so we end up with something like this, right? We can, we could basically have our website that goes talks to an API and a static site generator that basically builds up most of the static resources of our website. And I mean, like, when, when people think of static site generation, they think of like just the HTML and the JS, uh, JS side of things. But you could also statically render things like reports. That's a static rendering. Like, it's not going to change, right? Um, and then there are benefits because you can throw your assets in front of something like a CDN or a cache and you don't have to worry about stuff. Um, you will notice that you still need an API. So it's not a perfect solution. Um, but again, on the future side, it's great for se separating front ends from, from back ends. If you really, really want to have a front end team that's completely separate from back end, this will force you to go into that way. And like I said, you can't pre render everything. Um, on the development side, it is easier to scale if you have if most of your scaling problems become asynchronous bulk processing issues. Um, but you still need an API, so, you know, good and bad. On the operation side of things, it is freaking fast. You cannot outperform a static resource hosted on a CDN or in Nginx or in a cache. You just can't. There's, there's no way that you can make an application just as fast. And you do have more control over the application and server load because your application, you can literally have your, um, sorry, your admin management stuff off, off to the side. You don't have to actually uh, worry about it, which means you can also, it's easier to secure, right? If, you're, if you say that, okay, my website and my admin stuff are completely separate, and I make that so that my admin um, 
front end is completely only in-house and you can't move it, then, then you're good. Downside, every change is a deployment. So there's a fourth one. You can always mix and match, right? And this is probably the, the technique that people will ultimately use, is that you have to mix and match these techniques. You should use the right technique or right parts for the right job. And there isn't a, much to be gained from the sort of taking a purist approach of just getting all microservices are all pre-rendered um, pre content or just with monolith. You have to mix and match. Because ultimately, your end goal is to enable your team and your organization to scale your efforts. All right, just to summarize, um, so balance your free concerns. Think about it, things from a functional development and operational side of things. Some things are more important than others. Solve the problems that you have, so don't build out the things that you don't need. There is no one path to succeeding. Pick what works for you and ops is your friend because they will help you uh, ship your code and maintain your app. Thank you so very much. Dude. All right, uh, Do thanks, Zorin. Uh, I, th I think we don't have time for questions, but we can take them offline. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.